Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Ask GMBN Tech. Now this is the show where we get to answer your questions. So if you've got a question that you want answering, get in the comments below using the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Now we have a question from Nail Art Noob Noob, great name, and they say, is there any specific interval for checking air pressures in forks or shocks? Uh, not really, I would say. I think SRAM recommended it every 50 hours when you do that regular maintenance. But in my experience, when there is air leaking, it's quite obvious. It doesn't happen you know, over weeks and weeks at a time. It tends to happen quite quickly. Um, if you are gonna check the pressure on either your shock or your fork, what you need to be careful of is that when you connect your shock pump, it will be air from the suspension unit, which pressurizes the pump. So every time you did it, your reading is always going to appear a little bit lower. For instance, I know with my pump, at about 200, 250 PSI, to inflate the pump, it kind of costs the suspension unit about seven or eight PSI. Similarly, at, I have my forks at about 80 PSI, and at that sort of range, it takes away about one and a half PSI away from the suspension unit. So that's a way to consistently gauge how much pressure you're losing, if any at all. So I'd say do some dry runs to make sure you're not thinking you're losing some pressure, but actually what's happening is it's just pressurizing the shock pump. Next, we have a question from Elias Sandel, and they say, I just bought some Hope Tech 3 E4 to replace my SRAM level T's. A lot of letters and numbers in mountain biking brakes. I'm wondering how am, how am I supposed to replace the brake hose with the internal routing? I have a Trek Remedy 7 from 2018 where the hose exits the frame at the bottom of the down tube right before the bottom bracket. So first thing you want to look at when you're replacing hoses is looking, well for instance, the SRAM, SRAM system that you're replacing, the fitment is often crimped at the caliper end. That means that you can't, um, you know, that's installed from the factory and you can't fit that at home. So you don't want to be cutting the cable there or the hose there and feeding it through that way if your new cable is a similar orientation. Um, what I would suggest doing is either getting one of those rock shocks tool, which thread into both pieces of hose. So you cut the hose at the lever end, get the new Hope hose, which does have fittings that you can install yourself to, um, to fit to the caliper and just thread it in and push it through. Now, if you don't have one of those nice little kind of double-ended threaded tools, I've always used some six mil surgical tubing, which is a nice snug fit and providing you are pushing the new tube in rather than just pulling the out one, the old one out, it works really well. Um, but I did actually see a suggestion in our comments, which was really, really good. Just get a length of old spoke and feed it into the old one and feed it into the new one. And that kind of connects it. And that has the advantage of it being able to go through the exact same diameter hole as a hose fitting. So whereas the surgical tube on the outside might get snagged or might make it more difficult, that one should be all good to go. And then, yeah, just push the new hose in whilst, you know, maybe gently teasing the old hose, but don't go just yanking the old hose out because it will um, probably disconnect inside your frame, which is not what you want. But installing, you know, new hoses or cables isn't that hard to do. Just be patient, think about what you're doing and be methodical and I'm sure you'll smash it. Next question is from Nick Sertilia, I think. And they ask, do volume reducers give you less travel? How does it work? Um, so volume reducers don't reduce the travel of your suspension unit, but what they do is they reduce the volume of the positive air chamber, or almost always positive, although you can change the size of your negative air chamber on some shocks, but we'll get into that another time. Let's look at the positive air chamber here. Now, what that means is it goes from um, being something that is more of a linear suspension curve to one that is more of a progressive suspension curve. But what does that mean? Well, I've got this graph that we're gonna look on screen and I think it's the best way to understand it. So if we look at this graph here, what we've got is on the y-axis, so the one going up, we have the force and then we have the travel going along the bottom. So the more force that is exerted upon the suspension unit, the deeper into the travel it goes. 
Now what this means, as you can see with the red line, it has got more um, volume spaces in there, so less volume, and that means it's more progressive. So a linear suspension curve is quite flat and a progressive ramps up towards the end. So essentially it means it requires more force to get it through the last centimeter of travel than it does the first centimeter of travel. And that's kind of the best way to look at it. Now, what application does this have and why do people get so hung up on it? Surely you don't want your forks to just be too hard all the time. Well, that's where the volume spaces come in because it can mean that, for instance, for the same bottom out resistance, you can have them a lot more supple in the beginning and mid stroke, or you can have the same uh, beginning and very similar mid stroke for vastly more support towards the end of the stroke. So you're not bottoming out all the time. Now I hope that's nice and clear, but if not, take a bit of time to look at that graph and you should be able to work it out. So next up, we have a question from Luke Downey and they ask how to safely cut carbon handlebars and avoid carbon dust. So to cut a long story short, inhaling carbon dust really isn't something you want to be doing and can have detrimental effects upon your health. So how to avoid it? Well, a dust mask is obviously a really good option, but that's kind of a nice last defense. What can you do closer to the part itself? A really good tip is actually shaving foam of all things. This will kind of expand and yeah, just stop that those dust particles rising up into the atmosphere, into the environment for you to breathe in. So um, I would say line up in your cutting guide, having applied some masking tape on there if you could, this will stop any splinters um, as you're cutting the carbon, especially as, as you finish off. And then yeah, once you have your mark and you know exactly where you're cutting, just keep you know topping up with shaving foam and you'll be amazed at how well they kind of collect the dust so it doesn't get into the atmosphere. I hope that helps. So now we've got a question from 60 seconds of Stevens and they ask, does it matter that I'm having to put 230 PSI in my DPX2 shock, even though I only weigh 170 pounds? The shock is on a Polygon N9. Um, so I think this is probably derived or maybe the reason you're having this question is because a, a nice, easy to remember way to set up rear shocks is to put the PSI in the shock to roughly your pounds in weight, which is a nice way to set up a shock in no time at all, but it's not the be all and end all. Now, the pressure you have in terms of the number, the number doesn't really matter. It's useful when you're changing settings, but actually you want to go off sag and sag is kind of king. Um, now, the best way to do that is to just sit on your bike. Some people measure sag in different ways in terms of you know, whether they're in the attack position, whether they're just sitting on it. The way you do it isn't actually that important as long as you do it the same way every time. Um, personally, I like to you know, get my sag, know what number that is in, the, in the terms of pounds per square inch, the PSI. And then what I do is I will go use that PSI number when I vary, when I kind of experiment with the shock, so I know what I can always come back to, which is my sag. So a couple of things to really note with your air shocks. First of all, you want to have a look on the maximum PSI that the air can is rated to, which will handily say on the side of the shock. You do not want to be exceeding this number. Secondly, it's important to think if you had a brand new shock that has no air in it whatsoever and you just pump it up, well, you need to equalize the positive and the negative air chamber. You do this by cycling the bike through it's the initial part of its travel and the air will migrate from the positive to negative. This will give you a much better sag reading and be more representative of how the bike will feel upon the trail. But yeah, apart from that, you should be all good to go. Just um, go easy with it. Another thing to add, and it's the last, last thing, and then I'll be quiet, I promise. With your O-ring, say if we had one, on this shock here. Once it goes into its sag, it's not the center of the O-ring that is the mark of the how deep the bike is sitting into the sag. It's not the end towards the outside of the shock, but it's actually that inner surface of the O-ring there. Now that is your sag mark, and it comes just off that seal. So worth noting about as well. But yeah, setting sag should be nice and simple. Once you have your number, you can always go back to it. 
Now we have a question from Jude and they say, what pressure should I store my forks at? And my 2014 Fox 34s have massive stiction at the beginning of the st first stroke only afterwards, so I'm assuming when they're into the travel, they're fine. Is this normal and will it go away with use? So first two questions, what pressure should you store your forks at? Whatever pressure you ride them at is what my answer would be. And in regards to the large amounts of stiction in the initial part of the travel can often be a case of misalignment. So what I would do is um, unscrew your axle and leave it so it's um, threaded but not tight and just cycle the forks through a couple of times and then do it up. What can sometimes happen is if your fork legs are slightly twisted and then you do them up, it's binding them in that place. What you want them is to get them kind of be able to move freely. They will kind of auto correct and align in a way that's going to be prove less friction. Hopefully that's when you do up the axle and it should hopefully, if it is an alignment issue, correct it. If not, go to your local bike shop because something might be bent and there is no quick fix for that, unfortunately. Next question and the last question, and it's another suspension question. They're all coming today. And it is from Screwed Up Freaks 18, another interesting name. And they say, why do people put their rear shocks upside down? So we're gonna get this, which is getting a lot of use today, which is a nice cutaway. So what is upside down without sounding too existential? I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, you know, with your forks, sometimes they would be, you know, inverted. And especially when you've got an open bath fork. So that means there's a, basically, there's a lot of oil floating around in there. The orientation of the fork can be really important because it can keep the seals really effectively lubed, which is gonna deliver a fork or a shock with a lot better performance. But with a shock like this, all the oil is sitting inside the damper. So it's sitting inside there. This is obviously the air can, there isn't any oil. And when you do rebuild them, we do service them, sometimes you put a nice lick of oil, but not much in this negative air chamber. Now the negative air chamber is basically stuck between this seal here and those air can seals there. So whichever way you had it, it doesn't make too much difference. And I would say furthermore, once the bike is actually um, equalizing between the negative and a positive, that small amount of oil could work its way realistically anywhere in the air can. Um, I wouldn't really say there is an upside down, it just depends what works in terms of orientation for the designers and to make sure it's got frame clearance, that's probably the most important thing. Um, sometimes it works better having it upside down because they are having some type, kind of remote and the cable is going into that spot there, but it doesn't really make too much difference and I wouldn't get too hung up on it. So there we have it. That is a lot of suspension questions today, actually. <laughs> so if you want to stick with the channel, I am going to throw you to a video here of me doing a real-time service on a rear shock, similar to this one. And I'm going to throw you to a video down here of Doddy at the USE factory. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get in the comments if you have your own questions. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time.